You'll hear a lot of numbers in this film, but there's one number that's really most important for us, and that's the number one. And that's because in the last 400 years of music, with all the different changes of style and size of group, there's usually only one timpanist. Orchestras have grown dramatically four, five, or six times bigger than they were, and there are now more brass players in a modern symphony orchestra than there were in the first Baroque ensembles, but still only one timpanist. If you look at this huge array of drums, it explains a little bit about how we get over that problem. An orchestra of 24 players, with a choir of around 30, playing in a venue that seats a few hundred. Timpani usually play with the trumpets, but we also support the bass end of the orchestra. That's two cellos, one bassoon, and one double bass. As with all music, there is movement, energy, and contrast, but it's all about context. And yet another day with the same orchestra and many of the same players can be so very different. There's a gap of 140 years between these works, and they're really quite different, you might think, in almost every way. Although they're both choral works in Latin, Verdi's Requiem requires nearly four times as many players. And the acoustic is completely different, the Royal Albert Hall holding more than 10 times as many people. And so this piece and venue really benefit from a huge and powerful choir. And so, just about the only consistent thing between these performances is that, as all the other sections bulk up, there is still just one timpani player. The differences between these two pieces illustrate perfectly how timpani had to evolve as orchestras and choirs got significantly bigger. The drums for Bach are very small and quite punchy, enabling a fitting and triumphant ending that won't swamp everyone else. But for Verdi, I need something a lot more powerful, with a greater depth of sound and a longer decay. And the drums I'm using here are about twice as big as the ones I use for Bach. All musical instruments have unique characteristics and all instruments have evolved over centuries, and with some of them, change was dramatic and transformative. But with timpani, the interesting thing is actually how slow, gradual and undramatic change was. For now, let's just look at the size of timpani and the fact that, uniquely, ours is the only instrument of the orchestra that more than doubles in size over the centuries. The comparison from small Bach to large Verdi over 140 years is fairly straightforward. But how do we approach music from the same period of history when we perform it in such very different ways as we often do today? Here we are recording Handel's Messiah written in 1741 using forces typical of the era. There are just 15 players, 12 consort singers and 4 soloists. And here we are performing Bach's Mass in B minor, written just eight years later. We are back in the huge Royal Albert Hall, and so the chorus has been bumped up to 50 singers. There's a large string section, and we have extra woodwind players in order that their parts can be heard. 
Doubling the timpani would seem very odd, but this isn't a problem because I can choose to easily add to my sound simply by using slightly larger instruments. And so here we can see how important it is to be flexible when thinking about which instruments are right for a given occasion. Let's jump forward 50 years to the turn of the 19th century. Mozart has just passed away, and as Haydn is writing his final symphonies, his new star pupil Beethoven is writing his first, in a similar style, and the small classical timpani I used for the Bach prom worked just fine. But then, just a couple of years later, a musical Big Bang. OK, two Big Bangs, the starting gun for Beethoven announcing his new identity and style. This was a sudden change for the whole orchestra, and although I said earlier the evolution of timpani was mostly gradual, Beethoven suddenly gave us a much more prominent and independent role. Eroica is in a good high key of E flat. But small drums can struggle if the pitch is low. Also, we are required to play very loudly. And here, it's both of those things. Lower still and a loud solo, as I played this I could hear the low drum going flat. We were filming short excerpts and I had bigger drums standing by. What happened confirmed that I could never use these drums for a whole performance of this piece. And so we have seen the entire lifespan of this set of drums, from being new, big and modern for Bach, and now not being quite up to the job for this louder, muscular and relentless style. It's quite likely that the making of new instruments wasn't always a terribly calm process, and I can imagine worried players of the day begging their instrument makers to quickly come up with something reliable that would cope with these new requirements. We're about to hear that famous octave figure again, and then we'll hear the opening solo on some slightly later drums. Although they now play a variety of notes, we often refer to our middle pair of drums as the D drum and the A drum. And so let's look at the size of D drums and how this has changed. My brother wrote me a little computer program that works out the volume of timpani kettles. We can input the diameter and the computer will tell us the volume in litres. And then what I did was to look at the size of the orchestra both historically but also for some of the projects I have played on. It is very dangerous to generalise in music because there has always been so much variety and subjective opinion. But if we want to come to any conclusions about changes and trends, all we can do is take a wide view and come up with some average figures, however unsatisfactory they might be. What I discovered seems to have some recurring patterns. If you take the volume of a timpani kettle and divide that by the number of players, it seems as though there is a little over a litre of bowl volume for every player in the orchestra. That's quite a thing to think about, but perhaps it's more fun to think of it like this. Imagine we had to buy each player in the orchestra two pints of beer after the concert. Well, that is what would fit in our D-drum. The science around the shape and volume of the kettle is quite complicated, and so to express this in another easy-to-remember way, for 250 years there seems to be a remarkably steady increase of about one inch in diameter every 50 years. Of course it's not necessary to have lots of sets of timpani and always match them exactly. But perhaps it's useful to use evidence from the past, combine that with modern day experience, and see some advantages of the link that, historically, drums grew as orchestras grew. One of the advantages of linking the size of drum with the size of ensemble means that for any given piece, for a big fortissimo, the drum will be near its maximum. In other words, 
Playing a relatively quiet drum with lots of energy gives the right musical feeling while at the same time having the right output in decibels. If a drum is being played near its maximum volume, we can play it to its full and don't need to compress the sound, and we hardly need to worry about articulation or damping. And so whether it's Schumann, Beethoven, Verdi, Bach, Brahms, Mahler, or Handel, we can sound exciting and loud, but we won't dominate anything else by being overbearing or too boomy for the ensemble. Later on through this series, we will be taking a much closer look at what happened to timpani through different periods of music. But for now, to sum up 400 years of the history of the timpani, as the orchestras got bigger, drums got wider, and the skins got thinner, and the drums got deeper, and the sticks got softer, and you could tune the drum quicker, and the note got purer, and the note got longer and louder. <laughs>